I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. Defective telomeres are now linked to dozens of diseases and many types of cancers. And this is important because if you live a lifestyle that can extend the length of your telomeres, you're going to live a longer life. You'll be healthier. But you can't do it in a token way and expect good outcome. So we'll get into this in some length. And by the way, just the telomeres are what attaches to your chromosomes. Just imagine shoestrings and that little plastic tip that keeps your shoestrings from unraveling. That would be considered the telomeres. So we'll deal with that. There's some amazing benefits to tamarind for your skin and your hair and your health. We'll share that. And also, music therapy can help heal uh, neurological diseases. And a popular flowering herb acts as a natural stress vaccine. So we have a lot to share with you. Then we're going to do an in-depth look at GMOs, continuing our, our consumer health report on why we should say no to all GMOs. But we have something added today. We have a plant biologist who's written an editorial for Counterpunch. His name is Jonathan Latham. And he is now one of the scientists working in the field who has doubts about their safety and efficacy. When you see how tired most people are, it's a puzzle. And like any puzzle, you want to see if you can take each of the pieces apart, examine them, and then see where do they fit. And with a lot of people, they suffer from fatigue, but it has nothing to do with viruses. It's not chronic fatigue syndrome. It's not an Epstein-Barr virus. It's not a cytomegavirus. Instead, it's the adrenal glands. And when you examine the adrenal glands and you test their strength, you find that they're running on empty. And that's because every time you are stressed, no matter what the cause, legitimate or not, you pump adrenaline. You pump other hormones as well, stress hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, catecholamines. So we end up exhausted. We walk around, and a lot of people don't connect their exhaustion with their thyroid condition. That can cause fatigue. Anxiety causes fatigue. Depression causes fatigue. Being overweight causes fatigue. Not exercising can cause fatigue. So there's a lot of things that can cause adrenal fatigue. All of these I just mentioned are part of it. So you have to understand the endocrine system a little bit because the endocrine system must be put back into balance in order for you to heal. And the adrenals are very small, but boy, they are powerful. They are two very tiny glands, and they sit just on top of your kidneys. They keep cortisol and adrenaline imbalance. Now, those are your primary stress hormones, but they're also important for our metabolism. For example, they regulate inflammation in the body. You need to have them working because if you have something that you should be inflaming about, which is part of the healing process, you want to turn that on. But you also don't want it to stay on because inflammation that's chronic shortens your lifespan, kills organs. And also, your adrenal glands produce aldosterone, which helps control blood pressure. So almost always when you meet someone and you're speaking with them and you're getting a history, you find that if they have adrenal exhaustion, more often than not they have blood pressure problems. So just imagine that the adrenals are constantly going on and producing based upon stresses throughout the day. They're just exhausted. And the adrenals modulate a process initiated by the sympathetic nervous system when our body encounters a threatening situation. The hormones of the adrenal medulla contribute to this response. Now, hormones secreted by the adrenal medulla are epinephrine. By the way, epinephrine is the hormone that's more commonly known as adrenaline. And adrenaline 
is made by your adrenals. And it responds instantaneously to any kind of stress. But it also increases your heart rate. It rushes blood to your muscles. It rushes blood to your brain. And that's why in the middle of the night, you're sleeping soundly and suddenly you hear a sound. Instantly, you're up. Your vision has become acute. Your sense, All your body senses are acute. It also brings your blood sugar level up so that you can convert instantly glycogen, which is your stored glucose, um, to glucose, uh, which is active. And it also creates norepinephrine, and uh, which is also called noradrenaline. And that hormone works with epinephrine to respond to stress. And it can cause vasoconstriction and narrowing of the blood vessels. And that gives you high blood pressure. So when the adrenals are not doing the right thing, then you have too much cortisol that will aid you and kill you prematurely. And you have you have adrenaline in your body, and that's bad. So you have stages of this that you go through. Now, how would you know? Because sometimes you can have multiple causes for the same condition. If you have body aches, but you haven't been exercising in that area, depression, irritability, uh, the need for coffee, that caffeine rush, if you feel just tired, though you've gotten plenty of sleep, if you can't go to sleep or you have trouble waking up, if you have low libido, if you have blood sugar imbalances, if you can't concentrate, if you get dizzy when you stand up too quickly, if you have food cravings, especially salt and sugar, then you can pretty much estimate that your adrenals are shot. So what would be some of the things that we can do in a good way? What is the good message in this story? First and foremost, throw away all of your excess sugar, all of your processed grains. That means your processed pastas, white flour products, white sugars. Get rid of all of them. Get rid of caffeine and coffee completely. Get rid of all of the instant foods that you make because more often than not, they're junk. And that will help uh, cause the blood sugar to level out. And those spikes in blood sugar and insulin um, are almost always impacting adrenaline. Start bringing in the good fats into your diet. The good fats. Walnut. That's a good fat. Coconut. That's excellent. Olives. Terrific. Almonds. Avocados. Those are all good fats. And get rid of the margarine. And get rid of the uh, the soybean oil, the corn oil, the cottonseed oil, the peanut oil. Get rid of them. Make sure that when you go to bed at night, you actually turn off all electric meaning you turn off your computer, not just turn off the screen, but turn the entire hard drive off. Also, unplug your television from the wall. Because if you don't, you've just turned off the screen, but the all of the electronic is still pulsating, and that can cause an overstimulation in the body. Take out the battery from your cell phone. Don't allow any digital clock within six feet of your head because that digital clock at night is pulsing an electromagnetic pulse right into your brain. So cell phones, computers, tablets, uh, turn them off completely. Also, make sure that your room is completely dark. And if you need earplugs, use them. If you need an eye, soft eye patch to put over your eye, do so. Deep, controlled breathing has a very positive effect upon the adrenals. That's why meditation and yoga are good for your adrenals. Have a rainbow of food and juices every day. Start your day with some two fresh lemons or lime and then a grapefruit juice, fresh made, 
and put in there some vitamin C, which is terrific for your adrenals also, and pantothenic acid, which is terrific for your adrenals, magnesium and calcium at 1,000 milligrams of citrate, and then some green apple juice, 100 milligram B-complex, and drink that down. That rejuvenates your adrenals. Also, green tea throughout the day. You can make some wonderful eucalyptus green tea or lemongrass green tea, which is iced tea, which is very, very good. And just take time for easy adrenal relaxing exercises, yoga, meditation, power walking. Those are all good for you. And um, also spend some time with nature. Don't use artificial stimulants. Don't overtrain till you're exhausted. And make sure you're taking adequate amounts of DHEA. Because when your adrenal glands are not in balance, your DHEA level product, production will suffer greatly. You need DHEA, about 20 milligrams a day, because it creates all the hormones in your body. And don't forget the Rishi. Changa, C-H-A-N-G-A, or C-H-A-G-A, lion's mane, and cordyceps mushrooms. Those are all good for your adrenal glands. And there are certain adaptogenic herbs that help your body adapt to stressors. Ashwagandha, Panax ginseng, astragalus. Those are all great for adrenal health. You don't see it very often. Generally in the fall, you'll see tamarind, tam, T-A-M-A, rind, R-I-N-D. It's wonderful for you. It's common to the Thai and Indonesian cuisines. Most Americans never even heard of it, let alone had it. It's a small tree. It's actually native to the African continent, but it's been cultivated in India and other parts of the Asian continent. And it's terrific. It's a sweet, sour fruit. You take off the um, skin, which is kind of um, all very, almost like a cracker. That's the quality of the skin and consistency. And you'll see these little thin, look like wiry veins. And you just pull them back. So you, then you're left with the kind of sticky, like a stream bean. And that is what you make your tamarind whatever it might be, from. And it's a superfood. It's extremely beneficial. And it has terrific properties. What does tamarind do? Because you could take like a teaspoon of it and put it into an iced tea and make a tamarind iced tea. And then put some... And how you put mint into a, a cold tea is take a handful of mint leaves, like spearmint, peppermint, and you crush them. Just roll them around in your hand. Then put them in the tea and stir them. That releases the oils. And the oils are what give the mint its wonderful flavor and aroma. So by combining the mint with the tamarind paste... By the way, in Indian stores and in Manhattan, they're down on Lexington Avenue, lower part of Lex, around the 17th Street. I've also seen... Um, from 18th, you have about six or seven. And you can get a whole giant can of the tamarind paste. Um, and they don't have to be organic. Again, I, I'm, I'm gradually letting you know there are certain things that do not have to be certified organic because they're not sprayed and they have tough shells on them. And uh, it's just not necessary. Tamarind is one of them. So get the paste. So you put a teaspoon of the paste into your mineral water with green tea and mint. Then throw ice in there, then blend it till it's almost like a slush. That is one of the most delicious, thirst-quenching things you can possibly have, but it also promotes good digestion. It's been used to help people who have constipation and who might not have enough bile getting in from the bile duct uh, 
so to help break down fats. It also helps if you have ulcers, stomach ulcers. It supports your heart health. In Ayurvedic medicine, it's used as a cardioprotective, um, normalizing fruit. It can lower cholesterol levels. It helps your skin and hair. It's great as a tonic for skin and hair. For the skin, it can reduce inflammation and irritation, and uh, it's terrific for you, for your skin and hair. And it regulates blood sugar, so pre-diabetics and diabetics can have it. So that's our nutrient of the day. Now, most of my work dealt with how can we understand the aging process, slow it down, and wherever possible, reverse it. And what I figured out was that you have to extend the life of the telomeres that cap the chromosomes. So, for example, I had a thousand mice, and these mice live a certain length of time. So I kept one as a control, so it had its normal life. The only difference was I'd never keep them in cages. I, I believe that was very inhumane. So they could just run free in this 3,000 square foot um, lab I had. And others um, were a different color, and they didn't have the standard diet. They would have fresh juices I would make every day, and they would have raw foods, like give them lots of sprouted beans and nuts and seeds. They had a ton of that. And they lived 25% average longer. And then you put music in, and you give them challenges. You hide the food, and they have to find the food. So challenging environment, and this is also true for humans. People frequently live very boring lives, and the only way they can get out of this boredom is by going on the Internet or uh, watching television. They choose not to make their life more challenging. Instead of they look for substitutions, and that's not healthy. That's not how you live a longer life. So the more challenging your environment, and then re- caloric restriction. So when you put it all together, if you don't have high caloric dense foods like oh, butter and your trans fats and meat, those are high concentrations of calories. That, that will shorten your telomeres. When you're under a lot of stress, it shortens the telomeres. When you're not physically active, it shortens the telomeres. We're in a very polluted environment. It shortens your telomeres. When you've been exposed to pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, it shortens the telomeres. When you've had a lot of sugar in the diet and caffeine, alcohol, smoking, shortens the telomeres. So you do just the opposite. And that's how you lengthen the telomeres. Now, this is from a major scientific study. I'll quote it. Uh, this is from the Centro Nacional Investigations of Oncology. Quote, studying telomeres, the structures that protect the ends of chromosomes, has become a key issue in biology. In recent years, not only has their relation to aging been confirmed, but defective telomeres seem to be linked to more and more illnesses, including many types of cancer. The review published by Dr. Paula Martinez and Maria Blasco uh, in the Trends in Biochemical Sciences stresses the importance of investigating these structures to improve diagnosis and develop possible treatments for many diseases. Telomeres, in the opinion of these researchers, will become increasingly important in clinical studies. The chromosomes in every single cell are made up of DNA and shaped like strands with a kind of protective cap at the end of each strand of DNA. Without this end protective cap, the DNA strands would chemically bond to other strands, i.e. the chromosomes would merge, and that would be lethal for the cell. The structures that prevent this catastrophe are the telomeres. They're, they were discovered in the 1930s, but decades elapsed before someone decided to study them in depth, and since the late 1990s, well, they weren't aware of my work in the 1970s, because for 25 years before anyone was researching them, I was doing all this research. But the biologists are often surprised by their amazing and unexpected complexity and their health-related significance. 
quote, the bi- biology of telomeres is extremely complex. The more we discover, the more we realize what remains to be discovered. And then it goes on to talk about how they can cause cancer when you don't have them and they've been damaged. And they are correct. So now science is finally appreciating how important it is to have healthy telomeres. And yet as a nation, we're not doing that. The very things that shorten our telomeres, hence lead to disease and shorten our lifespan, those are our comforts. And we're not happy about changing anything that would make us feel uncomfortable. But there's one thing that they didn't say. Now, they were looking specifically at cancer. I want to play you a clip now. It's entitled, Chemotherapy Doesn't Work 97% of the Time. It's a short clip because just yesterday um, I was speaking with Utrice Lead. And Utrice will be on the program in a few days. We're just having an independent board-certified oncologist examine her first MRIs of her lungs and her uterus and her second set that was her just a couple of weeks ago. And the doctors, at, uh, after they looked at this, say, oh, good, now you're improving to where we can do some chemotherapy and surgery. And she asked the doctor, have you read my report, which is 90 pages long? And the answer was no. Well, then she said, why would you recommend a therapy like chemotherapy when you haven't read the report and I've done my homework and my homework shows that chemotherapy does not extend the lifespan of someone with stage 4B lung cancer? And the doctor simply said, well, you know, it's what we believe. Well, your belief doesn't count here. And once again, he is not trying to harm her. He would certainly like to see her do well, but... For all the oncologists in America, there's a step, there's two steps you have to take if you want to change. The first step is you have to stay, take a step away from the limitations of your existing belief system. You have to walk a step away from the paradigm. But that's easier said than done because with that paradigm comes your identity and your security. And frequently your reason for being, where people go in every day and give all the patients they see the same types of protocols. And if it doesn't work, they simply give them double the dose or higher dose. And only when it's clear to anyone, but almost last to the doctor, but first to the patient who sees it's not working and how they feel, Some patients actually beg the doctor to stop the protocol. And then the doctor, who's not feeling in the pain, whose hair's not fallen out, who doesn't have stomach ulcers, mouth ulcers, who doesn't have neuropathy, doesn't have all the problems from the chemotherapy, will say, okay, we'll pull it down a notch, as if somehow we must never get too far away from the paradigm, least off we offend it. So now imagine 950,000 doctors who are intelligent, who care about their patients, but they haven't yet asked a fundamental question. Is the paradigm I'm a part of, the tools I'm using, likely to give me an outcome that justifies the the effort I'm giving to the patient and does the patient has a better chance of surviving? That's the step away you have to take. Once you do that, then you have to take a step towards being truly free to make an independent decision. So when two board-certified physicians came uh, without letting anyone know uh, to the retreats, and they saw a whole different way of working with people, and there were no drugs, there was no chemotherapy, no surgeries, no diagnosing, no treating, but enormous changes, changes they had never seen in their entire medical career, didn't think were possible. And we're not talking about over a year or two years. We're talking about in one week, sometimes in two to three days. Well, they could not answer this because there are no answers inside the existing paradigm. You have to go outside that paradigm to see what might be available. And 
So now they have a phenomena. We saw something, we investigated something, we spoke with people, and there's nothing that we have that can address this. And that's where we end up taking a look. And is there not a different way to be able to help people with the desire that medicine has, but not rewarding people for their efforts, but rather rewarding people with their results? Because if we rewarded medicine for its results, 88% of all physicians in the United States would be bankrupt. Listen in now to this piece on chemotherapy doesn't work 97% of the time. Doctor, I'm going to talk about cancer a little bit. Um, various types out there. What are some of the things that you've seen in terms of your patients and what some of the things that you've been able to do? A better thing to talk about in relationship to cancer. Well, I will talk about that, right? A better thing to talk about, however, is the relationship between profits and cancer in the United States. Um, there was a study that was published, I believe it was in 1994. It was a 12-year program, 12-year study. They looked at adults who had developed cancer as an adult, not childhood cancer, but adult cancer, right? And this is the main types of cancer that we get here in the United States. They did a meta-analysis of these people all around the world who developed cancer as adults for 12 years and were treated with chemo. And they looked at the results. And they published the results in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And the results? 97% of the time, chemotherapy does not work. 97% of the time, it doesn't work. So why is it still used? It's one reason and one reason only, money. If you go to a medical doctor, an MD, with a sinus infection, and that doctor prescribes an antibiotic, he gets no financial kickback. Now, if he prescribes 5,000, you know, of that antibiotic in one month, the drug company that makes it might send him to Cancun for a conference, right? Mm -hmm. But he gets no direct remuneration. It's not with, with chemotherapeutic drugs. It's different. Chemotherapeutic drugs are the only classification of drugs that the prescribing doctor gets a direct cut of. So if your doctor prescribes chemotherapy for you, here's how it goes, more or less. The doctor buys it from the pharmaceutical company for $5,000, sells it to the patient for $12,000, insurance pays $9,000, and the doctor pockets the $4,000 difference. And there ought to be a law. The only reason chemotherapy is used is because doctors make money from it, period. It doesn't work 97% of the time. If Ford Motor Company made an automobile that exploded 97% of the time, would they still be in business? No. This is a, the tip of the iceberg of the control that the pharmaceutical industry has on us. We, most people have no idea of this at all. Now, I wrote a book. It's called The MD Emperor Has No Clothes, right? In my book, I have a bulleted list of 10 questions that every cancer patient should ask their doctor. 10 questions. I've had patients kicked out, literally, kicked out of the oncologist's office because the doctor was PO'd that the patient was asking them these questions. And these are just common sense questions. Cancer treatment in the United States, we have lost the war on cancer. We have lost the war on cancer. Why? Because cancer is not a reductionistic phenomenon. Cancer is a holistic phenomenon. And when you try to bring a reductionistic methodology like drugs and surgery to bear on a holistic phenomenon, you will completely miss the boat each and every time. You cannot do it. Medical doctors are like colorblind art critics. They can see that that's a boat. They can see the black and white outline, but they're completely blind to all of the colors and textures that make up the substance of the thing. It's no difference with cancer. The reason that people get cancer in the United States and the reason that we have completely lousy outcomes is because medical doctors are driving the research bus. 
When women get together and do a 5K run for breast cancer, all of that money, do you think any of that money goes to nutritional research? Do you think any of that money goes to homeopathic research or acupuncture or traditional Chinese medicine or naturopathic research? No. All of it goes to drugs and surgery, which do not work. Now, why aren't those women running for selenium? If every girl in this country took 200 micrograms of selenium in one generation, we'd eliminate breast cancer by 82%. That's a big number. Why aren't we doing that? Because medicine in the United States is a for-profit industry, and most people are completely unaware of this, and most people bow down to the altar of MD-directed high-tech medicine at their own demise. Okay.